Hello, crime historians, and welcome back to another episode of a crime story podcast. I'm your host, Kaylin Lois, a graduate student in international relations who lived abroad in France for two years. While abroad, I started hearing all of these insane crime stories that I never heard about. As a lifelong true crime addict with a fascination of how crime affects culture and alters history, I decided to turn this obsession, research, and stories into a podcast to tell you all about relatively unknown crime stories. In May 2008, 13-year-old Arushi Tawar was not up and ready for school. When her parents checked her room, she was found dead, and her live-in domestic worker, Hemraj Benjad, was missing in the same suspect. When Hemraj's body was found two days later, a true who had done it scenario began. In a case that rocked India and is known as the John Bonet case of India, this is episode 26 of A Crime Story, India's Noida Murders. In the year 2019, I was fortunate enough to spend six weeks in India near Chennai for an internship. I was amazed by the beauty of the country and the generosity of the people. India attained independence from the British crown on August 15, 1947, and became a sovereign democratic republic on January 26, 1950. The Constitution of India provides for a quasi-federal system of government. India has a high crime rate and is rated second in the world for murder. India has an incredibly unique legal system and is categorized as a hybrid legal system having elements of civil law, common law, equitable law, and customary and religious laws. The main sources of law in India are the constitution, statutes, customary law, and judicial decisions. Now the crime story. Arushi Talwar was born May 24, 1994 and was a 13-year-old student at the Delhi Public School. Her parents were both dentists, Dr. Rajesh Talwar and Dr. Nupur Talwar. All lived in an apartment together in Noida, India. Yam Prashed Banjad, better known as Himraj, was 45 years old and the Talwar's family live in domestic help and cook. Himraj was originally from Nepal. On May 15th, it was the second to last day of school, and Arushi was picked up from her school around 1.30 p.m. Her mother returned home from work around 7.30 p.m., and her father came home via his driver around 9.30 p.m. The driver then gave the keys to Himraj, who made dinner for the family that night. After dinner, Arushi's parents decided to give her an early birthday gift of a digital camera. They tested out the camera for a bit and then left Arushi's room around 10.10 p.m. Her mom later came back into the room to switch on a internet router, and Arushi was reading. Arushi's father then answered some phone calls and sent an email. The last time the, inter- the, last time the internet router was used was at 11.41 p.m. The murders were thought to have happened between midnight and 1 o'clock a.m., according to postpartum reports. At 6.01 a.m. on May 16th, the doorbell rang. Housemaid Barty was usually let inside by Himraj, but he was strangely missing in action. Barty had only been working with the family for six days. She rang the bell three more times and then called Himraj's mobile phone, but the call was abruptly cut. When she tried calling him again, the phone appeared to have been switched off. She was finally greeted by Nupar, who was on the balcony. This was extremely unusual as as the Tower parents were known to sleep in because they worked the evening shifts at the office. Himraj was the one who took care of letting the servants or the guests in. The gate at the entrance was locked from the outside, so Nupar had to throw Barty a set of keys. Rajesh was also awake, which was odd, and then when he entered the living room, he saw a near-empty scotch whiskey bottle on the dining table, which surprised him. He asked Nupar who had kept the bottle there, and then alarmed, asked her to check Arushi's room. When they entered Arushi's room, they saw Arushi's dead body lying on her bed. Rajesh started screaming, and Nupar remained silent. This is when the maid of the family made it into the home, and when she entered the apartment, 
both of them were crying. Nupar asked her to come inside Arushi's room. Bharti stood at the entrance of the room as Nupar walked inside. Arushi's body lay on her bed and it was covered with a flannel blanket. Nupar pulled the blanket and Bharti saw Arushi was lying on her bed covered in a sheet and her blue pajamas. A school bag on her head and her throat slit. Both of the parents immediately blamed Himraj for Arushi's murder in front of the maid. Bharti walked out of the apartment to inform the neighbors. The Tawars called their family and friends. A neighbor who lived one floor below the Tawars asked the apartment's security guard to inform the police. By the time the police arrived, there were 15 people in the living room and 5 to 6 people in the Tawars bedroom. Only Arushi's room was vacant. The crime scene had been completely trampled upon. The story of a murder in an affluent neighborhood attracted many journalists who gathered around the house by 8 a.m. and the police did not contain the crime scene. In fact, the media was even let into the home. The police told the Tawars that it was an open and shut case. Hemraj was still missing. The media reported that Hemraj had drunk whiskey, broke into Arushi's room, assaulted her, hit her with a knife, and cut her throat. Police announced 20,000 rupees, around $400, award for the, a tip leading to his arrest. An autopsy was conducted by noon that day, and she was cremated around 4 p.m. The tower staff was told to clean the room, kind of like clockwork, over and done. The next day, some visitors noticed blood spots leading to the terrace. The terrace had been locked the day before, and no one thought much of it. Eventually, the police were persuaded to investigate the terrace, but they could not get the key to the terrace door. The policeman later testified that when he asked Rajesh for the terrace key, he went into the house and did not come out for a long time. They left the matter alone until the next day when a retired police officer broke the door to gain access. As the group entered the terrace, they saw bloody drag marks. A body in an advanced stage of decompensation was discovered lying in a pool of blood at about 10.30 a.m. No one could identify the body, and Rajesh and Nupar were recalled to return home as they were on their way to lay Arushi's ashes. Later, the body was identified as Hemraj, who also had a slit throat and blunt force trauma to the head. It was estimated that 90% of evidence was lost due to police mismanagement. All the police really had to go on was the bodies. According to the police, Hemraj had told some of his friends about a threat to his life. A social worker confirmed that five days before his murder, Hemraj had told her he had feared for his life and some of his near and dear ones. Some other evidence that police poorly collected was that Hemraj's postpartum showed that he had not eaten dinner the night of the murder, but there was a plate prepped for him in the kitchen. Hemraj's bed was still made, showed that he had not slept in it. The scotch whiskey bottle with, with Arushi's and Himraj's bloodstains was found on the dining table. The bottle was seized on the, on the morning of May 16th, but no clear fingerprints could be recovered from it. Arushi's camera had photographs numbered 13, 15, 20, 22, and 23. This indicates that at least 23 photographs had been taken using the camera, out of which 18 had been deleted. The CBI, which is kind of like the American FBI, considered the possibility of the photographs having been deleted by someone other than Arushi. Around 3.43 a.m., nearly three hours after Arushi's murder, the internet router which was in Arushi's room was switched off. The CBI produced a technical expert who stated that the switching on and off of the router after a long gap can only happen due to either a power cut or manual intervention. There was no power cut on the night of the murders, in a fact that was attested by the electricity department. So, who killed Arushi and Himraj? One person who came to light was the old domestic worker Vishnu Sharma. Himraj was, was only supposed to be a temporary worker while Vishnu was on vacation, but when he returned to the Tawars, 
They liked Himraj better and decided to fire Vishnu. The police suspected that an angry Vishnu might have killed Himraj for stealing his job. Arushi might have been killed for being a witness. Vishnu was taken into custody along with former servants of the Tawars. However, the police were unable to find any evidence that connected him to the murders. It was confirmed that he was in Nepal on the day of the murders. On May 21st, a clear suspect came into play, Mr. and Mrs. Tawar. There were no signs of forced entry. Arushi's bed was only eight feet from her parents. How could they not hear what was happening to Arushi? On the morning of May 16th, Rajesh asked the police to stop wasting time in his house and pursue Hemraj instead. He even offered to cover the cost of the police's visit to Hemraj's native village in Nepal. Rajesh ignored the police request for the key to the terrace door, an attempt that could have been made to hide Hemraj's body, and when it was discovered, he couldn't identify it. The family cremated Arushi the very day of her murder in a hasty manner and a friend of the family asked the medical examiner to remove any mention of sexual assault from the post-mortem report. According to the police, Hemraj knew about an extramarital affair that Rajesh was having and after dinner on the night of May 15th, Rajesh brought Hemraj out to the balcony to discuss the issue and ended up murdering him and somehow Arushi saw the murder so Rajesh had to kill her because dead people don't talk. On May 23rd, Rajesh and Nupar were taken to the police lines area where they were split up. Nupar was put in a room with her cousin and a woman constable, while Rajesh was arrested and taken to a local magistrate. Rajesh was then taken to Dashna jail and later claimed that he was not allowed to make any phone calls. The police threatened him for, into signing a confession on his way to jail. Rajesh claimed that he was being framed by the police to cover up their own botched up investigation. The case was transferred to the Central Bureau of Investigations on May 31st at the request of Arushi's parents. According to the Tawars, the idea that Arushi and Hemraj were having a relationship and that Rajesh's extramarital affair was planted by Krishna Tadrahi, an assistant at the Tawars Dental Clinic. Raja said that two days before the murders, he had reprimanded Krishna for making an, an incorrect dental cast. On June 7th, Krishna was detained on suspicion. He was arrested on June 13th. Meanwhile, lie detection tests conducted on Rajesh and Nupar Tawar both turned out to be inconclusive. The second set of tests did not find any evidence of deception on their part. During questioning, Krishna discussed an accomplice, Raj Kumar, who was a domestic servant for neighbors. On June 27th, Raj Kumar was arrested on suspicion. And on June 30th, 2008, Vijay Mandel, another friend of Krishna, was reported as a suspect in the media. Vijay was a driver and domestic help for the Tawar's neighbor and was arrested on July 11th. During a press conference on July 11th, 2008, the police stated that the case was still unsolved. He stated that no evidence had been found against Rajesh Tawar, but he also added that the CBI had not given him a clean chit. He stated that Krishna, Rajkumar, and Vijay seemed to be the prime suspects based on narco test but the CBI had not found any corroborative evidence against them because they all gave different versions of what happened that night. Rajesh Tawar was released later for lack of evidence, having spent 50 days in prison. The three other suspects were arrested, but drug-induced confessions were not enough to charge him. On top of that, all three men had strong alibis. The three men were were released from jail in September after the police could not find any solid evidence against them. In September 2009, a new CBI team took hold of the investigation and in December 2010, they named Rajesh Tawar as the main suspect. In January 2011, the Tawars filed a petition protesting against the CBI's attempt to close the case and their petition was rejected. The Tower's trial began on May 11, 2013. The defense lawyers focused on the opposing clean shit given to Krishna, 
Rajkumar and Vijay, providing counter arguments to points that raise suspicions on their clients and pointing out lapses in the police's investigation. The state sequence of events was that Rajesh heard some noise that c- came from Himraj's room, but he could not find Himraj in his room, so he heard some noise coming out of Arushi's room. He picked up a goth club stick from Himraj's room and rushed to Arushi's room. He saw Arushi and Himraj in an objectable position on Arushi's bed. In a fit of anger, Rajesh hit Himraj's head with the goth club. When he tried to hit him for a second time, Hamraj moved and Arushi was hit. Awakened by the noise, Nupar Tawar came into Arushi's room. By this time, both of the victims were near dead and they both decided to hide the evidence and make it appear that Hamraj killed Arushi. On November 25, 2013, a special CBI court held Rajesh and Nupar Tawar guilty of the two murders and were given life sentences the next day. In January 2014, the Towers challenged the decision in a high court. On October 12, 2017, the high court acquitted the Towers of all charges, stating that the evidence presented by the CPI against the Towers was not satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt, and therefore they must be given the benefit of the doubt instead of being convicted based solely on suspicion. Today, no one has been convicted of the double homicide this completes the 26th episode of a crime story what do you think of today's story do you think the parents are guilty or someone else you can comment on a crime story instagram at a crime story pod where i will be posting images from today's story or you can comment on a crime story podcast on facebook or at a crime story pod on twitter or even see additional photos on a crime story podcast on youtube i'm also on tiktok under the name A Crime Story Podcast. My website is acrimestorypodcast.com where you can listen to the podcast as well as read a transcript of today's story underneath the blog tab. Thank you so much for listening. If you could please leave a review of the podcast, it helps others find it. Also, if you could tell a friend about a crime story, I would greatly appreciate it. I hope to see you next time on April 21st where I will be covering a case from South Africa. You won't want to miss it. A Crime Story is created, hosted, researched, written, and edited by me, Kaylin Lois. Sources for today's episode can be found on my website, acrimestorypodcast.com. The artwork for the show was created by Sabrina Smith. The music is by Ross Budgen. Additional story editing is brought to you by my father, Mike. Thank you so much for listening to A Crime Story. Stay safe at home and abroad.